If we took Angus Taylor's advice and the government started to cut spending, what would happen? Yeah, well, we'd be in a recession. Um, As Greg rightly said, the only thing that's keeping the economy out of recession, the only thing that's stopping the economy from going backwards at the moment, this quarter and last quarter, is government spending. One for mum, one for dad, and one for the country. And there has never been a more exciting time to be in Australia. Budgets are about choices, Fran, and you show what you value through the choices you make. This is coal. Don't be afraid. The Don't be scared. The the treasurer. Treasurer I want an economy that works for people, not the other way around. We'll just end up being a third-rate economy in a banana republic. Just follow the money. G'day, and welcome to Follow the Money, the Australia Institute's podcast that explains economics, politics and policy in plain English. I'm your host, Ebony Bennett, Deputy Director at the Australia Institute. And most Australians will know this instinctively, but last week it was really confirmed. The Australian economy, it's not doing well. The national accounts data that we got yesterday proved what many had been expecting. The economy has almost ground to a standstill. Growth just 0.2% in the June quarter, 1% for the year, the lowest outside COVID since the early 90s. The main story in these figures is consumption. Uh, Consumption went backwards and discretionary spending fell substantially. Treasurer Jim Chalmers has credited record government spending for keeping Australia out of recession. Let me make that clear again. Uh, Without government spending, uh, without growth in government spending, there'd be no growth in our economy at all. We do not need another reserve rate hike in this economy. That inflation number is going to come down regardless. And in terms of where growth's at, well, we're going to have tax cuts feed into it next quarter, aren't we? So uh, it's a waiting game for the government, a patience game for the Reserve Bank as well. I think the government would be as happy as you can be. Uh, This vindicates the approach that we took in the budget. And it frankly torpedoes a lot of the free advice that we got at budget time uh, to cut harder and harsher. We are in the longest per capita recession on record and the cost of living is hitting Australian households really hard. 13 interest rate hikes from the Reserve Bank of Australia in under two years were essentially designed to bring down inflation by suppressing excess demand in the economy. Problem is, there really isn't any. Households are struggling to pay for essentials, so they're certainly not splashing cash around. But inflation is still too high, and it's regular Australians who are copping it on their mortgage repayments, their gas bills, rent, and at the supermarket checkout. So to help us make sense of what is going on in the economy and at the Reserve Bank, I'm joined by Australia Institute Chief Economist Greg Jericho. G'day, Greg. Hi, Ep. And with him is Matt Grudinoff, Senior Economist here at the Australia Institute. G'day, Matt. G'day, Ep. So, Greg, I'll start with you. Just paint us a picture of what is happening with the Australian economy at the moment. How is it travelling? As you said in your intro, not travelling well. You're right. Six consecutive quarters of going backwards when we, in a sense, strip out population growth. So GDP per capita basically takes away um, population growth. And, yeah, it's gone backwards six consecutive quarters. That's a record uh, stretching all the way back to when the ABS started counting GDP, which was back in 1959. So it's a pretty, pretty long time. But really, when you drill down to what is really going on is that uh, the private sector is pretty weak, households are not spending, and the only thing that is keeping the economy out of a true recession of total GDP, total economic activity going backwards, is basically just government spending. And that's mostly government spending in health and social assistance areas. So we're talking sort of a lot of NDIS spending and things like that. You take that away, yeah, we probably probably are in a recession. And uh, it's all down to basically those 13 interest rate rises that have really had an impact. And you certainly see that with household consumption that's just crashing. Crashing. So, Matt, how do we find ourselves in this position? What has happened to get the economy in this way? Yeah, well, as Greg says, we've had 13 interest rate rises. So it's not a surprise that uh, household spending is as bad as it is. Um, Household budgets have been really crunched. If you have a mortgage, then you've seen it. The interest payments massively increase. And um, that's really causing households to cut back. But even if you're a household that doesn't have a mortgage that you rent, for example, 
rents have increased quite dramatically as well. So households are having to make really difficult decisions and, and that means cutting particularly non-essential spending. Mm. And so if households are struggling so much, Greg, and inflation really isn't being driven so much by by spending, the Reserve Bank, obviously, it, it can only, you know, incre- like it can only move interest rates. That's the tool in its toolbox. But why has it done so many in such a short space of time when we look at what's actually happening in the economy? Well, I think to be blunt, because they got it wrong. <laughs> I mean, I think that's, yeah, as you, as again, you said in the intro, they raised interest rates because they essentially believe that inflation is caused by excess demand. What they mean by that is essentially there's too many people out there shopping, too many businesses investing and building new factories, buying new materials. Uh, material that basically there's just a wash of money flowing around the economy and the best way to reduce that is by raising interest rates because as Matt said you raise interest rates you can't avoid that you can't say to your bank oh look I don't feel like paying my mortgage this week is that okay Mm -hmm. Uh, you have to pay it and when you have to pay something that means you are unable or you have to in a sense choose not to buy something else and that's um, those non-essential items. And the reason why that's key is because those non-essential items, a lot of services, a lot of things that you'd buy in retail, they're the areas that employ a lot of people. And when you stop shopping, businesses, shop owners are like, geez, it's a bit quiet this week. It's a bit quiet this fortnight. Oh, hell, it's been a bit quiet for three months. I think we'll cut back on hours. We'll cut back on staff. That means unemployment rises. That means there's less pressure for wage rises. And as a result, there's less money flowing around the economy. That's the theory. The problem is, uh, as our research showed, that the the real driver of inflation back in 2022 and into 2023 wasn't wage growth. It couldn't be because wage, wages were going backwards in real terms. You know, wages were rising by less than inflation. Everyone kind of understands that. <laughs> no one was feeling like they were doing well. So what was driving inflation was was profits and supply side issues due to the war in Ukraine, due to us just coming out of the pandemic and things like that. And yet the Reserve Bank reacted as though it was almost like we're in a mining boom. Mining boom. Yeah, like we, <laughs> because we saw during the mining boom in the 2000s, yeah, there probably was a bit of excess demand because the mining boom. And also John Howard thought, hey, let's give everyone, keep giving everyone tax cuts that we didn't really need. So we kind of were awash with money. That wasn't the case here, but the Reserve Bank's like, oh, well, it's inflation. It must be excess demand. Let's let's hit everybody. Yeah, and, and I mean, in effect, the Reserve Bank, everybody thinks, is the only uh, institution that's supposed to take care of inflation. And they have one tool, increasing interest rates to slow it down. So even though it's totally the wrong tool to use right now, they are feeling a lot of pressure to use it uh, simply because it then looks like they're doing something. And the other thing to remember with this kind of supply side inflation is it generally washes through the economy and then disappears all by itself. Um, And we're seeing across the world inflation increase and then decrease in all countries pretty much at the same time, Mm. um, which tells us that it is this worldwide shock that's causing it. And, And as it disappears, well, you know, Sure, interest rates aren't helping it disappear, but it is going to disappear and the Reserve Bank can say, look, we're doing something. Yeah. And, and also this line that oh, inflation is too high. I mean, it's not really. I mean, the only reason we say it's too high is because the Reserve Bank back in the early 1990s decided that the target range is 2 to 3%. Now, that's an arbitrary thing. Um, it sort of was based off of an economist in, in the Central Bank of New Zealand who was thinking 2% was kind of it. It's we could have set it at three to four percent and said that's where we want it to to be stable and or that's, two to four percent yeah Give us or a bit two of to four percent <laughs> you know I mean f- people might remember before the pandemic we had about five to six years where it was below inflation was growing below two percent so below the target band and the Reserve Bank didn't do much there then. wasn't a lot of panic then. yeah no not much panic what the Reserve Bank worries about is that accelerating inflation, which we saw in early two thousand, uh, sorry, twenty twenty two, where it was going from three to four to five to six. You know, that's yeah. accelerating now. It's sort of bumping around between three and a half and four. And you know, there are many economists. Um, John Quiggan, uh, the University of Queensland, is one who says 
what's wrong with that? Why shouldn't we actually target a bit higher inflation that helps sort of stimulate the economy? As Matt and I have often sort of said, you know, when we talk about cost of living, one of the reasons why there's a cost of living crisis is because wages aren't keeping up with inflation. If wages are growing at 4% and inflation's at 3.5%, in effect, that's no different from if wages are growing at 3% and inflation's at 2.5%. It's still, you know, just yeah. a half cent increase. And it's this sense of, oh, no, it's above the 2 to 3% range. It's too high. It's like, well, who decided that? Yeah. Someone. And we've decided that that is... You know, like Moses coming down from Mount Sinai, we, we <laughs> it must can never be outside no. two to three yeah. percent. Yeah, I think people kind of might be shocked to know that that's just arbitrary. It's not necessarily based on any mm. kind of, well, any economic principle necessarily, and that we can change it if we if we wanted to. Matt, in recent days, the treasurer Jim Chalmers and the former treasurer Wayne Swan have kind of been a lot more critical publicly of the Reserve Bank, or at least the impact of all those interest rate rises. Uh, the Reserve Bank is putting economic dogma over rational economic decision making, hammering households, hammering mums and dads with higher rates, causing a collapse in spending and driving the economy backwards, doesn't necessarily deal with the principal uh, pushes when it comes to higher inflation. Jim Chalmers says higher interest rates are smashing the economy that insists that's not an instruction to the bank. And I think the Australian people, frankly, uh, expect me to tell it like it is. And I've been making that point for some months. What I said overnight wasn't new. Why do you think they're, they're speaking up now, I guess? Yeah, well, I think they're right to be critical. As we've said, the Reserve Bank is increasing interest rates. Um, that tool is not the appropriate tool right now. But I think the main reason is because the economy has slowed so much that we really are in risk of going to a recession. And so what we have to now ask ourselves is, is inflation, you know, half a percent or, you know, 1% above the target band, is that worse or better than a recession? Because mm. that's what we're basically deciding right now. If we leave interest rates high or, you know, God forbid the, the Reserve Bank decides to increase them again, then we really are staring down the barrel of a recession. And we need to remind people how bad recessions actually are. Recessions are terrible things. They lead to mass unemployment. The Department of Treasury, to their credit, after the 1990s recession, did a deep dive into exactly what the impacts and the scarring on the economy um, was, and it was terrible. There was a heap of particularly men in their 50s who lost their job in the early 90s and were never employed again. They remained unemployed until they reached 65 and they went from being unemployed to pensioners. Mm. Um, there is mass misery when we have a recession. So the idea that a half a percentage point of inflation per year is somehow worse than a recession is just crazy. Like to, to even compare the two is crazy. And so if the Reserve Bank thinks that we have to put the Australian economy into a recession in order to reduce inflation by half a percent a little bit faster, then I think they should be criticised for that. And Greg, I'm just curious, like you've talked about the role of profits. Is, is there any recognition at all from the Reserve Bank that it's not excess demand in the economy? Like no, no, they've kept, uh, they've kept, in a sense, doubling down on it. I mean, certainly our research in uh, middle of 2022 and certainly into 2023 was very much pointing this out and the Reserve Bank took issue with it, pushed back, said we were wrong, even as the OECD, the IMF, the the Bank of England, the Federal Reserve and you know, everyone else was going, actually, this is happening everywhere. Uh, the Reserve Bank kept sort of steadfast to its no, its excess demand. And you can understand in a sense why, because if they admitted that it was an excess demand, then they have to answer the question, well, why are you raising interest mm. rates so mm. much? So better to just keep hold to your faith. And look, the reality is right now, as we predicted 18 months ago, Profit growth is slowing, and also we've seen inflation growth slowing. You know, we weren't expecting profits to keep going mad as they were back in 2022 and early 2023, and we weren't expecting inflation to keep going at that rate. So what we're seeing now, however, though, is the Reserve Bank uh, Governor Michelle Bullock in her um, answering questions uh, last week, I think it was, after she gave a speech, she kept talking about excess demand and when Journalists said, yeah, but the economy is not growing very fast. She was like, oh, it's not just the growth. It's actually the total amount of spending 
and this suggestion that our spending isn't increasing, but we're spending so much more than we were in the past. Well, that's wrong as well, because if you sort of look at the the trend, basically we're spending less now. Households are spending less than we would have expected, say, before we went into the pandemic. So it's a case of how can that be excess demand if we're actually doing kind of worse than we were expected to be? You know, the pandemic's over. We've got migration coming in. Every There's no lockdowns or anything, and yet we're spending less than we would have expected. And that growth is going down. It doesn't really make sense. It doesn't match up with with the data, and yet it's still the line that being pushed on oh, excess demand. We have this, you know, the, what was the line, Matt? Uh, it's the, running a bit hot. The, the economy is running a little bit hot. This he, is what- uh, He said the, that? The uh, Reserve Bank's chief economist. Yeah, Assistant Governor, uh, <laughs> Dr. Sarah Hunter, I think her name is. Uh, this was at a um, Senate estimates or a Senate committee hearing uh, in August saying that the problem is the, the economy is running a little bit hot. Now, this was said in August, and we got the figures out for the GDP for April, May, and June that showed us basically in a recession if we didn't have government spending. Now, if that's a little bit hot. It's amazing. I, I really don't want to know what, what a cold economy is like. Mm. So you've picked up there on you know the fact that it's not kind of excess demand or Australians splashing cash around everywhere that's causing all this inflation. But I'm just curious, the opposition, the shadow treasurer, Angus Taylor, Matt, has been talking about that this economy, it's Labor's responsibility. This is what happens when you have a big spending Labor government that's completely out of touch with economic reality. Two years of wrong priorities, two years of wrong decisions, two years of economic mismanagement, two years of blame shifting, two years of finger pointing and two years of drift. You cannot spend your way out of a poor, out of a poor economic management. It's also clear from these numbers that the government is hitting the accelerator at the same time as the Reserve Bank is hitting the brake. And, and that is how you wreck the engine. And uh, those expansionary budgets are simply making the inflation problem worse. If we took Angus Taylor's advice and the government started to cut spending, what would happen? Yeah, well, we'd be in a recession. Um, as Greg rightly said, the only thing that's keeping the economy out of recession, the only thing that's stopping the economy from going backwards at the moment, this quarter and last quarter, is government spending. Um, and it's also quite interesting that the, uh, the opposition would say this because the inflation actually kicked up under the opposition's period. And to be clear, the opposition wasn't responsible for it, right? It happened across the world. But, you know, if we're going to go into petty party politics, um, as the opposition and the government like to do, and blame each other, well, it started under the coalition government. And when we look at big spending governments, coming out of the pandemic, the biggest spending government ever was that coalition government. And again, they did the right thing. They needed to spend big during the pandemic, but it's a bit rich for them to be arguing, firstly, that the uh, inflation is Labor's fault when it started under the coalition, and it's caused by big government spending when there was no government in Australia's history that spent bigger than the coalition government during the pandemic. Yeah, which, as you've said, was the right thing to do, but they they'd still... Yeah. Like that's mm. that's their legacy, right? They yeah. they brought in JobKeeper, they brought in JobSeeker, which were both needed at the time, but they were not small programs in terms of government spending. To be clear, this is not a petty politics thing. It's not been this is a worldwide phenomenon. We see it across the world. Neither party is responsible for this inflation. Australia is not responsible for this inflation. Um and so anytime you hear one side or the other, you know, saying, "Oh, it's all their fault." you know, they're talking rubbish. Yeah, mm. and, and if there was any excess demand that helped sort of power inflation in the early days, it wasn't. It was basically due to all that excess spending because we were given money. We couldn't actually spend it because of lockdowns. This happened around the world. And when everything sort of cleared up, people had money to spend. Now it was, you know, understated compared to profits and also it was very much benefiting wealthy people not to – Lower income people. And those but, 13 interest yeah. rate rises have more than sucked have all of us out. out. So, but it's a case of, you know, who cares that that led to that? You, they did the right thing at the time. You, mm. Economics is not precise. And this also goes back to this line of, oh, when you hear economists talk about a recession to, to lower inflation, they always talk, oh, it'll just be a small one. Just 
just a blip. Just, just a little a, one. Just a fraction. <laughs> it's like, yeah, that's what uh, they were thinking in 1982 when they raised interest rates to try and get down inflation. It was a killer inf- recession. That's what they thought in 1989 and 1990 when they raised interest rates to, to kill inflation. It was a decade long. Yeah, to, to be clear, recession. in the early 90s recession, it took 10 years for unemployment to come back down to pre-recession levels. So it was elevated for a decade. Yeah, so that's pretty dire. And at the moment, government spending is the only thing that's keeping us out of recession. But back to the problem of inflation, Greg, and getting that under control. So if higher interest rates aren't solving those inflation problems, what can the government be doing on inflation specifically? Well, first of all, not listen to the opposition. I mean, and I think this needs to be underlined, this whole thing about extra spending fueling inflation. It's it's completely wrong because all of that spending is really going to the NDIS. And, you know, if you look at job growth over the last year, about 43 to 45% of all new jobs have come in healthcare and social assistance. And we know from history and we know just from reality, most of those jobs are going to women. They're not jobs, they're not competing for jobs in the construction sector or manufacturing. So suddenly builders are going, oh, I need to get workers. I haven't got enough workers because they're all going into healthcare. And so, yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> that, and we know that too yeah. because wages have not massively exactly. increased. If, if, if there was a huge competition for labour out there, then firms would be outbidding each other and we would see wages massively increase and we are just not seeing that yeah. at the moment. So first forget that. Um, but also we know that governments can do things to, to reduce inflation. We've seen them actually do it in terms of things like an, the energy supplement that literally had an impact on reducing inflation. Now you'll hear people say, oh, yes, but that's, uh, that's just reducing the technical definition yeah, of inflation. Yeah, I, I don't understand this, Greg. I've heard, I've heard a couple of journalists kind of talking about, oh, but that's just artificial. They're artificially regi- – but like – if you're the person at the end of that electricity bill, do you, do you care that yeah, it's artificial yeah, or do no. you care that and, your and inflation also, is lower? If this kind of inflation is temporary inflation, which it is, as the shock resolves itself, the inflation works its way through the economy and it disappears, and that's what we're seeing across the world, then the best thing the government can do is temporarily lower the inflation while the shock is happening. Mm. And then as the inflation disappears, you remove the rebates. And, you know, effectively what you've done is is lower that inflation rate. Yeah, there's often you'll hear some say, oh, yes, but when they take away the the rebate or the, the subsidy, inflation will go back up. And it's like, no, now inflation is high. We're trying to get it down. When it comes off, inflation will be low. Yeah, it might bump up a bit, but it's basically helping sm- make that drop a nice sort of smooth one rather than a crash. Sense- <laughs> yeah, or also it's a case of people need help now. Mm. In 12 months' time when overall inflation, the supply side issues have lessened a lot more, those international factors have lessened a lot more, it's not going to be such an issue. So governments can certainly do that. We've seen, uh, you know, there have been calls by economists such as Isabella Weber, who uh, we've had on on webinars here at the Australia Institute, uh, a brilliant uh, American economist who said, actually, governments can institute price caps. They're able to say, no, you're not going to raise essential items, the price of essential items. We're not saying go in and put a price cap on Tim Tams. So like, you know, hey, why not? That'd, that'd be good for me <laughs> personally. Say, yeah. <laughs> I'm just thinking. Uh, yeah, but, you know, things like energy, things like rents, things, um, you know, with gas, things that were actually, one, there's good profits already being made by these companies, so it's not like uh, we're going to be sending them to the poorhouse. Mm. And they're temporary and, and, know, and in some cases, as you mentioned, not things that actually the government or the Reserve Bank have control over, like increasing interest rates doesn't help reduce gas prices yeah. because of the war in Ukraine. Yeah, that, that is a great point. And we really need to look at what are the major drivers of inflation right now and ask the question, what are interest rates doing that? So the biggest drivers at the moment are building a new home and rents. Do you think rents are going to come down if interest rates are higher? No, higher interest rates are going to drive higher rents. 
The other huge driver is insurance because of a, a number of different areas, but particularly climate disasters. Are higher interest rates going to reduce climate disasters? Oh my God, imagine that. Imagine <laughs> if it was that simple, well, that's if simple. higher interest it's, rates can solve climate change. <laughs> exactly right. So these kind of major drivers of where inflation are at the moment are not being affected by interest rates, which gets back to what we were originally saying. This is not demand-driven inflation. Higher interest rates are not lowering this type of inflation. Every Australian worker will get more money in their pocket after the Prime Minister's shake-up to the Stage 3 tax cuts. Tax breaks for the country's highest earners will be halved and the money used to deliver cuts to more people as rates and thresholds are reworked. I think people uh, know that there's cost of living pressures out there. Uh, this is just one of the measures that we've put in place. But not everyone is happy with the PM accused of breaking an election promise. We need big reforms. And indeed, Anthony Albanese's decision to recast Scott Morrison's 2018 tax cuts to suit the economy of 2014 is the biggest and most honest piece of tax reform in Australia for decades. OK, so apart from the rather disturbing idea that Reserve Bank has just got this prognosis entirely wrong, I want to come back now and finish with the actual economy, which is in you know, dire straits by the sounds of it. We're in a per capita recession. As economists, what is normally the prescription when an economy is going into recession like this? What should the government be doing? What should the Reserve Bank be doing, Greg? Well, one of the good things is the government has already got something in place and we're already feeling the effects of it now, and that's the the amended stage three tax cuts. That's in a sense a stimulus to households. They're going to have more money in their pocket to actually spend. So that's going to help actual consumption. Now, a lot of it might, and one of the things that economists will be looking at is what happens when the next GDP figures come out. Have people gone out spending and what type of things are they spending? Are they just helping pay those bills rather than actually, oh, we've gone clothes shopping or something like that. So Mm -hmm. that's going to be interesting, but at least that will help sort of spur some activity. Now, again, critics are saying, oh, that's going to increase inflation. We're like, well, you know, there's no spending at the moment so if anything our economy needs people shopping and if we can't cope with it we've got a pretty terrible economy as as if that's going to destroy it but the reality is what you should see when the economy is weak is the government actually help out so the stage three is going to help out um, especially given that they amended it so it's not just all going to rich people it's actually going to help people whose savings have been wiped out so it's going to very much help that Things like the the energy supplements and and subsidies, they're really good in helping keep inflation down at the moment. But really, it's about not panicking, going, oh, we better cut back on everything and go into austerity because that is essentially going to just chase your tail down down the like drain. we saw yeah. happen in the, the UK. The government basically has two tools. It has fiscal policy, monetary policy. On the fiscal side, um, they need to start running a larger budget deficit. That is, the government needs to put more money into the economy. So we've spending. seen so we've seen two budget surpluses. That's right. But that yep. might not be a good idea for the next budget. Exactly right. If the economy is about to go into recession, absolutely. So the government And, and the good thing is they're not projected to have surpluses. The, the no. most recent budget they are projecting deficits, which is good. But a deficit basically means that the government is spending more money. It's putting more money in the economy than it's taking out in taxation. So it's Mm -hmm. stimulating the economy. But on the other side, um, a monetary policy, which we've outsourced to the Reserve Bank, they need to cut interest rates. And cutting interest rates will do the exact opposite of what we've seen the interest rate rises do. It'll put more money into households' pockets. And hopefully those households will go out and spend it if they're spending less on their mortgage then they're able to spend more on other stuff and that will also help stimulate the economy. And then I guess if we can play that out, so then if uh, the government does put more money into the economy, if the Reserve Bank next year cuts interest rates and we do see spending pick up and the economy pick up and that causes inflation, then potentially if we're going by this conversation that we've had today, an increase if like inflation starts to go uh, increasing too much again, then it would be appropriate for the yeah, if, interest if, rates to rise because it is driven by spending, but that's just not the case that we're in now. Is that right? If we see a booming economy where everybody's doing well, wages are rising and inflation is caused by that booming econ- economy, then absolutely that is the point at which the RBA should increase interest rates. 
It's just that's not what's happening. At that's the not what's happening in and the al- economy. And also, we know from history that generally, interest rate rises are more powerful in stopping an economy than interest rate cuts are in stimulating it. Because, as I said before, you can't avoid paying that extra amount on your mortgage. But when the mortgage comes down, quite a number of people are like, actually, I'll keep it where it was. I'll take it. You know, I'll see if I can pay off my loan a bit Get a faster. Bit ahead. Also, it's a case of you you're not forced to go out and spend where you are forced to pay that mortgage so mm. the the actual um the what you're trying to achieve with those rate rises or rate cuts the power of them is very much weighted towards the the stopping the economy it's really good at stopping the economy and we saw during the pandemic to start the economy you really have to do something drastic like go down to 0.1%. You, know, you have to almost say, look, please, it's free, go and spend. Then, yeah. And then have you know. the governor say, we're never increasing it and until yeah. 2024. Yeah. You, you're completely safe to go out and yeah, borrow, borrow, borrow. Exactly. So, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm fairly sanguine at the moment of worrying about uh, an, an excess demand fueled mm. um, inflation. If we start seeing real wages grow by more than 1%, and so what I'm talking about, wage growth is, growing at, say, 4% and inflation growing at 2.5%. So you, if that starts happening, then you might think, you know, but even still, what you have to remember is since the start of 2020, so since the start of the pandemic, people's real wages have gone down around 5%. Mm. Now, that means we've basically lost your your wage can buy about 5% less stuff than it could four years ago. Now, it's not about just recovering that. It's actually about getting back to where we should have been. And to do that, we actually need faster growth. We actually need to sort of make up for that loss. And if you're just, oh, no, sorry, you can't ever make that up, we're always going to be kind of behind where we should be. And there's never this um, acknowledgement of that from the Reserve Bank or even from often from the government, of actually people have really lost out over the past four years. Yeah, we've gone backwards. Yeah, and if we just grow at the same pathetic, to be honest, rate we were growing before the pandemic, the 10-year, we're not going to get back to where we were in 2020 until the mid-2030s. You know, so it's 2032 or so and you go, oh, great, I've got a, my wage can buy about as much stuff as I could back in March 2020. That's pretty terrible and that's what we're looking at. And just finally, I guess, I'm, I'm just curious about the Reserve Bank. I'm sure most people listening assume that if you get to, you know, work at the Reserve Bank that everyone knows what they're doing, but they've really not had a banner couple of years. As you said, Phil Lowe, the former Reserve Bank governor, kind of promised in the pandemic that interest rate rises wouldn't happen until 2024 and then they raised them. 2022. (laughs) (laughs) Um, And quite a number of times consecutively. Now they're really misdiagnosing what's causing inflation and really imposing harm on the economy in a way that's not going to fix it. I mean, Jim Chalmers as treasurer has been looking at what the role is and implementing some reforms to the Reserve Bank. But, like, is it how much of a worry is it that they've got it this wrong so many times? Well, I'll just say, remember that Phil Lowe was, in a sense, an RBA lifer. He'd been there forever, and they replaced him with Michelle Bullock, who had been there forever. (laughs) You know, it it really there is an institutional. ideology, I guess. And certainly if you've been in the Reserve Bank all your life, you kind of think that interest rates are, you know, the tool that must be used at all times and and that they can be carefully calibrated, I guess. And I think that is an issue of the institutionalization of it. And we're seeing, and this is a very interesting debate at the moment, with the government looking to introduce a monetary policy board as opposed to the actual RBA board that hopefully brings in a few outside voices, although what we're seeing is the opposition uh, are not wanting that to happen and for some bizarre reason the government is actually listening to them Mm. uh, rather than saying uh, actually the RBA needs reform. But, Matt, yeah, it, it basically I think that's, that's certainly an issue that we've seen is this unwillingness to sort of think outside the box a little bit. And 
I guess to follow up on that, there seems to be this idea that even though the Reserve Bank is independent, like that it should be immune from criticism. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, this is a fascinating thing. So we've seen John Howard and various other people come out and say that Jim Chalmers shouldn't be criticising the Reserve Bank because they're independent. Now, that's actually the opposite, right? If you're independent, you don't care about criticism from somebody who can't influence you. Independent people should be subject to criticism because they're not beholden to anybody. Um, and so therefore, there should be a public debate about what they're doing. If they're not independent, if the government has complete control over them and tells them what to do, then absolutely the government shouldn't come out and criticise them because mm. they're the ones that can control them. But, you know, if the RBA is independent, then it should be subject to criticism. And look, to be clear, monetary policy is a super important part of the economy, as we've talked about. High interest rates can put an economy in recession. Those people who are in charge of monetary policy should absolutely be subject to scrutiny. And that scrutiny where you think they're doing the wrong thing should include criticism. Um, and when they're doing the right thing, we should praise them. But, you know, they should not be above criticism because then you've got this really important tool in the economy that is, is not subject to scrutiny. Yeah, and it's, and it's not like Jim Chalmers is going down the Donald Trump line of saying, I'll sack the Reserve Bank governor and put in a board who would cut do interest rates, bidding. do what I want. You know, <laughs> yeah. I mean, that kind of thing, you'd say, yeah, that that is uh, crossing the line of this whole independence. But yeah, as Matt says, if you're independent, Michelle Bullock can say, yeah, thanks for that. And, <laughs> Th thanks for yeah. the free advice. We'll take thanks it on board. Thanks for the free advice. Yeah. And, Which is essentially yeah. what they've done. <laughs> exactly. I mean, yeah. There's, and, you know, it's it'd be weird if he was talking about, say, the Secretary of the Treasury because then it's like, well, that's your department. What are you doing? But yeah, I mean, the Reserve Bank, I mean, is is independent. There are certainly sort of break glass in case of an emergency if the Reserve Bank governor just goes insane. Mm. The government can step in and say, right, we're overriding you. But no one's sort of suggesting at this mm. point that that be done. But there's certainly nothing wrong with having a bit of a debate about is monetary policy going well? and you know, it's the Reserve Bank is generally pretty careful at not criticising the government, but they're always they they speak in a, in a way in which gets across whether they think there's a bit too much spending or but, not. But and I would argue that the Reserve Bank should actually criticise the government where where they think that the government is doing the wrong thing. I mean, mm. if you go back to the uh, the mining boom, as you said, John Howard was busily cutting taxes again and again every mm. year while the, economy while the was Reserve Bank yeah. was increasing interest rates and the Reserve Bank was terrified to say, actually, we're having yeah. to increase interest rates because you're running a really loose fiscal policy um, and we need to do that to slow the economy. So I think that both sides should feel free to criticise mm. the other and that's healthy in a democracy. We should have a debate of ideas and those ideas should be presented so that people know what the hell is going on. And similarly, when Joe Hockey was deciding to practise austerity, and the Reserve Bank was cutting interest rates to keep the economy yeah. going. And it was a case they were kind of, yeah, they, they were worried about saying anything. So they kind of were always all this dopey speaking in code where everyone's trying, oh, that's what he, they're really saying. It's like, you're right. Maybe let's just actually say, say it. Say what we and mean. And if Jim Chalmers gets criticised by the Reserve Bank, there's this, the problem that we've had built up over the last 30 years is this sense that the Reserve Bank is God. The Reserve oh, Bank sacrosanct. is right. The Governor of the Reserve Bank, oh, they don't make mistakes. So if the Governor of the Reserve Bank said, oh, the government's spending too much, they're right. And it's the sense of, oh, if Jim Chalmers or other economists say the Reserve Bank is got interest rates too high, oh, they're being political. It's like, mm, yeah, you know, that's Well, that's and if you're Jim Chalmers, you know, like if you're the government too, it's not the Reserve Bank that's going to wear the pain mm. um, no. if uh, the economy does go into recession, like the government will bear the brunt of that so you can understand his frustration yeah. as well. If government spending is keeping the economy out of recession. Well, yeah. and, and also the, the figures just bear him out in the sense of, the Reserve Bank was predicting that household spending in the past year would grow by 1.1%. It grew by, what was it? 0.5%. 0 0.5%. 0 0.5%. Less than half what the RBA yeah. thought that households were going to spend. And, and So the RBA like forecasts have been wrong too. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, households make up more than 50% of the economy. So getting that wrong by half is, is a big miss, especially yeah. when 
household spending is the thing that is most directly affected by interest rates. Most directly. It's not affecting as much business investment. You know, BHP and Rio Tinto aren't caring about the cash rate or interest rates. They they have their own bond uh, borrowings and things. Households really do worry about it. And mm. they got that wrong. And that's something that should be, um, I think, deserve of, of criticism. And I think it's also, it certainly is political. Jim Chalmers really started sort of mentioning this the day or two before the GDP figures came out. He would have known, like everyone knew, that they were going to be weak. But also, if you look at what has hit, you know, household incomes most, it's it's interest rate rises. That's it. And the fact that real wage growth has not been strong. Yeah. It's not been solid. But at the same time, they're getting smashed by interest rates. Well, I think that's all we've got time for. Thanks for joining us on the show today, Greg and Matt. Thanks, Thanks for having sir. us. You can find more research about the Australian economy from Greg, Matt and the rest of our team at our website, australiainstitute.org.au. And we would love to hear your thoughts on the show today. You can reach out to us via email at podcasts at australiainstitute.org.au or you can find us on Twitter at the Oz Institute with an AUS. Our theme music is by Jonathan McFeet from Pulse and Thrum with additional music from Blue Dot Sessions. I'm Ebony Bennett. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.